welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 10 of the Madden America podcast. This week we have a very special guest for you. It's been my honour to be able to interview Dr. Peter Bregin. Dr. Bregin is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist and former consultant at the National Institute of Mental Health. He has been called the conscience of psychiatry for his many decades of successful efforts to reform the mental health field. His work provides the foundation for modern criticism of psychiatric diagnoses and drugs, and leads the way in promoting more caring and effective therapies. His research and educational projects have brought about major changes in the FDA-approved full prescribing information or labels for dozens of antipsychotic and antidepressant drugs. He continues to educate the public and professions about the tragic psychiatric drugging of America's children. He has authored dozens of scientific articles and more than 20 books, including medical books and the bestsellers Toxic Psychiatry and Talking Back to Prozac. His most recent book is Guilt, Shame and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions. As a medical legal expert, Dr. Bregin has unprecedented and unique knowledge about how the pharmaceutical industry too often commits fraud in researching and marketing psychiatric drugs. He has testified many times in malpractice, product liability and criminal cases, often in relation to adverse drug effects and more occasionally electroshock and psychosurgery. Dr. Bregin has taught at many universities and has a private practice of psychiatry in Ithaca, New York. For a career as long and distinguished as Dr. Bregin's, we have decided to devote two episodes to hearing him speak. This first part covers Dr. Bregin's career, his views on psychiatry and psychiatric drugs, and also recent developments with the trial involving Michelle Carter. Part two of the interview and an upcoming episode will focus more on the trial and Dr. Bregin's involvement. Dr. Bregin, thank you so much for talking with me today for the podcast. It's long been an ambition of mine to be able to chat with you, and I'm very grateful to you for making the time for this. Given your long career and your lengthy list of achievements, it's tricky to know where to begin, but I wanted to ask, you're a very well-known and long-standing critic of psychiatric drugs, but when was it in your career that you started to become aware of the problems associated with the medications used in psychiatry? Well, I was 18 years old, so I'm 81 now. I mean, what does that come out to? 63 years ago, I was a freshman at Harvard, and a friend asked me to come out to a state mental hospital as a volunteer with a new program that he and his brother were starting. And I went out to Metropolitan State Hospital, which was um, your typical snake pit bedlam horror show. It's 1954. And when I walked in, my immediate impression was my Uncle Dutch's description of liberating a Nazi extermination camp. Even the death rates were very high in these horrible institutions. The brutality involved lobotomy, electroshock, insulin coma, all were known at the time to be frankly brain damaging and to kill brain cells. Um, Now it's denied. Uh, Psychiatric science goes backward. But it was known then from autopsies, gross autopsies. Of course, the lobotomy is destruction of brain tissue. And they knew that insulin coma and shock treatment were doing the same. They considered them all very similar uh, interventions to damage the brain. And, um, And I saw the drugs come in. That's the period of time when the drugs came in. You could see that the wards got quieter because the patients were robotic and stupefied. Mm. And in fact, a few doses of Thorazine uh, in those days was the uh, initial big drug. A few doses of Thorazine would do to a patient what it would take days of battering in a Nazi concentration camp to do Mm. or extermination camp. It would make the patients robotic, docile, and obedient. Uh, Just one or two shots, one or two pills in those days could do that. And it still does that. We do that in emergency rooms all the time with violent patients, no matter how energized and angry and frustrated they are, whether it's because they're on on speed or because they're deeply upset or whatever, you know, you can knock them down right away with the. with with a a dose of these drugs and uh, became obvious to me that all this was about damage for the purpose of control. Mm. And um, I knew that and I decided to go to medical school because that would provide me the best opportunity 
to do reform work. Hmm. Now, in some ways, psychiatry was much better in the 50s because there was at least a wing that may have constituted 5 or 10% of the profession that had some psychological or psychoanalytic training or even training in programs of social psychiatry and community psychiatry, hmm. which don't exist anymore. So there was a wing of psychiatry that really supported me when I became leader of this program. I, I, I got to, to originate and co-author my first book. It was about the program. I got to go to conferences as a college student and give talks about volunteers. I developed a program in which we got uh, more, almost all of, the, all of our patients. I think it was 10 out of 12 or something. I write about it in toxic psychiatry out of the hospital which was they never expected that we could do with just a little supervision. And then we, we had hundreds of, pay, of uh, volunteers also going through the hospital and making contributions. So I went in thinking that I would be working as a part of the psychosocial wing of psychiatry. Hmm. But by the time, uh, and in fact, our program was written up in the 1962 President's Commission on Mental Health. But that was the last large government document that supported psychological and social approaches because it's right about then that the myth of the biochemical imbalance begins to evolve. The research starts coming out about so-called, uh, well, about neurotransmitters, but about their so-called role in, in mental disorders about which we still know nothing, if there is any role at all. Um, and by the time I graduated medical school in, in uh, 62 and, and, you know, got my rest of my training at, at Harvard and at State University of New York and Upstate Medical Center where Tom Zoss was, I knew what I believed, but psychiatry had become so vicious toward any psychosocial approaches that they actually tried to get Thomas Zoss fired in 1962, and I was there at the time, 1963, from his position as a tenured professor at the State University of New York and Upstate Medical Center, the, the director of mental health of the state tried to get him fired because he wrote a book called The Myth of Mental Illness because he, quote, didn't believe in mental illness. So the psychiatry I entered was actually a much more closed and violent toward its critics organization that was devoted to the pharmaceutical industry. And when I applied to Harvard, it was known as a psychosocially oriented program where you got a lot of uh, supervision to do therapy. And the next year, when I actually entered the program, they had changed overnight. Hmm. And it had nothing to do with, um, with uh, science. It was a political change. And I sat down with Jerry Clareman, who was the director of research and would go on to be the head of NIMH. See how far back my connections go. Because <laughs> I, I started as this kid at, at the state mental hospital and, and, and I was working with Harvard professors around the state mental hospital program. Mm. <laughs> so it goes way back to 18. I was, I was literally at 18 working with full professors at Harvard and Tufts. So um, I've never said that before, actually. I mean, but it's obvious. I mean, those are the people who wrote recommendations for me to go to medical school. Um, so I, um, I said to Jerry said to me, what do you want to do, Peter? Cause we were first name basis. I'd known Jerry when he was chief resident hmm. at this program that I was at, which was the, the most valued program in the country, the Harvard program at the Massachusetts mental health center. And I said, Jerry, well, I want to advance theories of personality and psychotherapy and understanding human nature. And he said, Peter, it's got no place in psychiatry anymore. It's going to be all about computers for diagnosis and medications. Hmm. Now, that's in 1962-63. So you can see it was a political program, which he, which was so loved by the pharmaceutical industry, of course, that he ended up being the head of the National Institute of Mental Health. Hmm. Um, so it was all political changes going on at that time. And so I went into private practice, and I'll finish on this theme very quickly. I went into private practice. And realized that uh, there wasn't a place for my thinking in organized psychiatry that I would just go into private practice, which I never dreamed of doing. And I was in private practice for um, 
about two or three years when I found out lobotomy was coming back. Mm -hmm. And then I said, no, 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 no. And I organized an international campaign. It took me four or five years to stop the return of lobotomy and psychosurgery in the Western world. And I succeeded mm -hmm. at huge cost in terms of the attack on me and the finances and all kinds of things. But I was shocked. I didn't think that the AMA, the APA, and everybody like that would go after me for opposing lobotomy. Mm -hmm. And then I got my great realization, which is that there was no difference between lobotomy and every single other treatment in psychiatry. Shock treatment is a closed head lobotomy with electricity, and the drugs, uh, which are neurotoxins, all impair frontal lobe function. That's how they all work. Mm -hmm. And that was the great insight that that came after a few years of of being in the field. Well, Dr. Bregan, for many years now, you've stood up for individuals and families harmed by psychiatric drugs and represented honesty and integrity when challenged by some of the world's wealthiest and most powerful businesses. And I wondered, when you look back, how you feel about that? I feel blessed. Hmm. I feel um, the... Um, I'm, I'm proud. I am proud at this point in my life. I'm 81 years old now. It's a very great blessing that I'm alive, that I've, uh, you know, lived. Mm. And very blessed to have Ging Ginger Bregan as my partner for the p first past 35 years, because the first 20 or so were very lonely, very, very lonely. Mm. And then uh, 35 years ago, Ginger and I got together, and I've never been lonely again. Mm. Um, the... Uh, I feel I feel proud and glad to have been allowed to do this work. I periodically get very frightened. Mm. I got very frightened at the start of this attack on me. And Ginger got frightened. And then we remember what we're here for. And then we get martial our resources. And we discover how many people there are to support us. That's always the astonishing thing that happens. People just, yeah, whatever, Peter, we'll do whatever. And so now we're out there because we're not just fighting for ourselves to protect my free speech. That's a minor part of this. We're out here to protect free speech, period. And my particular purpose here on Earth is is about psychiatry and uh, and also saving sparrows. Mich Michelle Carter turns out to be a really uh, – a really uh, a sparrow that's a victim of some of the worst hawks in the world. Mm. Mm. That's it. Michelle Carter is a sparrow who's a victim of some of the worst hawks in the world. Dr. Bregan, sometimes I honestly wonder how people in your position can continue all of your good work, knowing as much as you do about the injustices that are done to people in the name of mental health. Well, you know, it was um, very hard for years especially uh, before Ginger. But one of the things I concluded was um, that, that our job here on earth isn't to win because it's not a winning place, mm. that our job here on earth is to behave as morally, ethically as we can. Mm. And um, I've actually been very surprised by a lot of what I've managed to accomplish. I, I didn't anticipate the, the success of stopping most, not all, but almost all lobotomy in the Western world. I didn't expect the success of, uh, chain, of you know, helping, if not instigating changes in a lot of the FDA labels for drugs, the, all the antidepressants and all the antipsychotics, their labels have been very heavily influenced by me. I didn't expect a lot of this, some of the big legal victories and so on. Uh, stopping the violence initiative, all the things described in the, in the book, The Conscience of Psychiatry, I didn't expect all that. And I wasn't even sure for a long time that I would live, that I, you know, that I wouldn't be done away with. Mm. So... On the one hand, I get appalled at what's going on every day. Every day, Ginger and I debrief the day, mm -hmm. the horrors of the day, the news and our work, the world as well as our own work. We debrief it almost every day. Um, but on the other hand, 
uh, we know that um, uh, we don't get to determine our effect. And uh, that's determined by a combination of chance and societal pressures, and I believe a higher power, um, which is not popular in Europe, I know, as a concept. But, um, <laughs> uh, but, but I think it's not in our hands whether we succeed in life. It's in our hands how we live it. Mm. I got the gift of at age 18 of seeing something that was terrible that I could right at that moment begin to do something about. And um, that's a good thing. It is a wonderful thing, Dr. Bregan, and I'm so grateful to you for sharing those insights with me. I also wanted to mention that in the UK recently, there was a BBC documentary which talked about the potential link between SSRI antidepressants and violent behaviour, and it mentioned the James Holmes case. There was a huge outpouring of feeling after that documentary was shown, firstly with many saying perhaps these drugs aren't as benign as we've been led to believe, but also with accusations of scaremongering and pill-shaming. And I wanted to ask, how should we best warn of the potential dangers and risks without frightening people who may be physically or psychologically dependent on the drugs? It feels like a delicate balance. Well, I don't think so. Hmm. I think this whole idea about frightening people is a creation of the pharmaceutical industry and organized psychiatry. Where else do we not tell people the truth? I mean, the people who are pushing global warming, I don't see them being afraid of uh, scaring people. Um, no, I, I, I think that's a false, uh, a false uh, approach to the problem created by threats from psychiatry and the pharmaceutical industry to shut us up. And I heard that from the very beginning of this issue. Um, when I opposed lobotomy, oh my God, he's taking away the last resort for people who need it. How dare he, uh, uh, how dare he scare people. Uh, we were doing lobotomies in the prisons here, and I called a psychiatrist I knew from my training and said to him, uh, you know, will you back me on this? And he got enraged at me. You're scaring the prisoners. I work with prisoners. Well, of course I want the prisoners being aware of the dangers of lobotomy. If the local surgeon comes by wanting to help him out, give him a lobotomy. So there is good reason to be frightened about all psychiatric drugs, especially long term. Long term, they behave like any other neurotoxins. A neurotoxin is a drug that impairs brain function. And these not only impair brain function, but the highest functions. All of them impair frontal lobe function, where all of what we think of as human uh, is expressed through. And they impair the uh, 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 temporal lobe and the amygdala where so much else goes on, including memory and more about emotional control. They, they impact on the limbic system and the basal ganglia because the brain's an integrated system and that, that all gets into motor control and lower, uh, uh, deeper kinds of dementias. So, no, people need to be concerned. And we, we have a moral obligation, if we have this information, to share it. And I believe that the best information to give people is the truth. Mm. Now, as of now, the main problem with people hearing information about how harmful the antidepressants are is that they shouldn't try to come off them quickly because they're not only dangerous to take, they're dangerous to come off. People can get deeply depressed and self-punishing and suicidal. They can get violent and angry, and they can even get manic, the opposite of what you'd expect coming off antidepressants. So that's what they need to know. Does that frighten people? Well, I don't know. It certainly should inform them about the risk of starting the drug and of stopping. And then there are huge risks in starting because in the first few days, we have this huge amount of adverse effects occurring after one, two, and three doses. I've written about this, uh, describing the effects of Paxil. So it's dangerous to start them, dangerous to stop them. And I believe that anybody who is able should attempt to not be on these drugs long-term 
even if you think they're helping you, consider the literature, the scientific literature. I describe it in Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. Bob Whitaker describes it in his books. Peter Goetze describes it in his books. Lots of people out there since I started. And they, they are disabling long-term, sexually disabling. They're disabling to the feelings. They, they create apathy. And the person doesn't even know it's happening to them. My term, medication spellbinding. The person doesn't even know it's happening to them. So if you're on these drugs long-term, ask your loved ones if you're as caring as you used to be. See if you even care about your dogs as much as you used to, or your grandchildren or children or the other things you've cared about in life because they tend to cause an apathy. So I advise all people to consider a carefully conducted withdrawal of psychiatric drugs when they're on them long term and try to get a really good clin clinician who's experienced involved. But you as a human being are still the ultimate judge. Of, of when and how to go about withdrawing from psychiatric drugs. We can't rely on psychiatry. Mm. They are drug pushers now. They don't even know how to help you come off psychiatric drugs. You're right, Dr. Bregan. It's telling, isn't it, that if you do ask a psychiatrist about withdrawal, they almost always say there won't be a problem. And that's partly because they believe their own mythology that the drugs are safe, effective, and benign. Well, that's right. And... Um, they need to be frightened too. They need to be frightened into knowing that the information's getting out because they know about it on one level or another. I remember one time I went back to uh, my old medical center at the State University of New York and I gave a talk, it invited me back, on brain damage from shock treatment. And uh, the students, was, these are residents in psychiatry, they were kind of... Um, of uh, stunned looking and some of them tried to argue with me and then finally one stood up and said look we all know it's brain damaging so what it helps people that's a staggering attitude to have that the destruction of lives is somehow helping mm -hmm. it's absolutely absolutely and dr bregan since psychiatry has hitched its wagon so completely and utterly to medication and to the pharmaceutical industry do you think psychiatry can be saved i don't think psychiatry wants to be saved they want to win. Everything about psychiatry and the pharmaceutical industry, of which they are now nothing more than, uh, well, partners. The American Psyche, when I attacked the uh, in the New York Times, when I at attacked the coalition in a letter to the editor between psychiatry and the drug companies, um, the medical director, Mel Sabshin, of the Psychiatric Association wrote back and published in the New York Times a rebuttal saying that I didn't understand that psychiatry had, quote, an ethical partnership, end quote, with the pharmaceutical industry. Well, you can't have it as a provider of services to human beings, have an ethical partnership with giant corporations who have only one desire, which is to drug your clients or patients. So, no, the um, psychiatry isn't ever going to want to change. And um, so I don't know what is going to happen. Hmm. I think that people have to stop going to them for drugs. It's got to be a consumer-oriented approach. Now, not everybody agrees with me. Some really great folks in the reform movement are still trying to change the mind of organized psychiatry. And I say, bless them, go about it. You're doing great work and you're publicizing the issues and the publicizing of the issues to the public, which you're doing so well, my, my friends, is the main thing. Thank you. And Dr. Bregin, you were an expert in the recent Michelle Carter case. Michelle was convicted of manslaughter for allegedly killing her boyfriend by texting him encouragement to complete his suicide efforts. And you're currently writing a series of blogs on Mad in America about the case. Now the prosecuting attorney for the state of Massachusetts is going after you to stop your blogs, and I wondered if you could tell us more about that. The judge in the Michelle Carter case um, asked the assistant district attorney hmm. to send me a copy of his order, which was an emergency order with ex parte, without me there, without uh, the attorney Cataldo there, because he couldn't get there, 
the attorneys who are extremely aggressive and vigorous in the pros- per- first the prosecution of Michelle, but also in her persecution before she even went on trial and the things they gave to the media, they have been so aggressive um, against her. Actually, the most aggressive I've ever seen in many, many years of being involved in trials and watching the coverage of trials. They tried her in the public arena. It seemed to be trial by media rather than trial by jury, didn't it? Well, it was trial by media, but it's really trial by the district attorney using the media. Mm. And as a result of my then beginning to talk about Michelle in a series of blogs on Madden America, um, they then decided as a part of their keeping the media under their control with negative information about Michelle, even after her conviction and sentencing, they decided to try to shut down my blog. Mm. And I didn't know that from the judge's order. His order is very moderate about repeating the things that, that are, are um, embargoed mm. and asking um, the attorney for Michelle Carter uh, to please um, obtain the materials that he's supposed to obtain for me to be sent back, uh, including the uh, Conrad Roy documents. And then he says, and the Michelle Carter documents, her, her medical records, depending on whether I have a release. And I have a release. He didn't know that. Hmm. I had a release from the lawyer, and now I have a release from Michelle herself. So he wrote a very... Uh, considered response to their the wild attack on me. Hmm. But I didn't know how wild their attack on me was until the attorney, uh, the district attorney's office of Bristol County wrote a, uh, uh, sent me as the judge requested his conclusions, but on top of them, I don't know if they did this purposely or by mistake, was her handwritten cover letter. Hmm. The cover letter, which you can now find on my website, there, you can get this. You could go there right now and get this. And this is what the last sentence to the judge is. The Commonwealth's apostrophe S requests this court order Peter Bregan to cease any publication, comma, description of any information he received in the course of this case until further notice of the court. Mm -hmm. Now, that's way beyond any particular records, which are basically Conrad Roy's records Mm -hmm. being uh, embargoed. This is, I can't even talk about my, you know, uh, my testimony. I can't talk about anything. Mm. In other words, stop his blog. Well, it sounds like censorship. It's complete censorship. It's advanced advanced censorship, which I don't believe is allowed under the law. You get to stop somebody from writing because you think you're not going to like what they're going to write. And so I've decided to go public with that. We're we're not, uh, when I say we, I mean uh, my wife Ginger and I, we're not going to, we're not going to take this sitting down. This is much too much of an attack from the the uh, district attorney. And on August 10th, but I didn't get to see this until two days ago when their snail mail got to me mm. with the materials the judge asked them to send me, but they sent me this other document as well. Um. Maybe they expected to intimidate me rather than to arouse me. So I'm still planning to completely cooperate with everything the judge requests. Mm. That's my plan. I'm doing it. But I'm not going to stop the blogging as I was planning to do uh, because um, this is not about respecting the judge, whom I do respect. This is about... Uh, a massive attack of my freedom of speech, which people need to be aware of before the hearing on Monday, August 21st. 
Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Dr. Bregan. It seems now that the desire is to prevent the disclosure of any information that may be contrary to the publicly available narrative, but that sounds unreasonable to me. Well, it's a, it's a, it's about as anti-American, anti the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that you can get. Mm. Um, to try to prevent publication, to get a judge to order somebody not to write, I don't believe has any place at all in the Bill of Rights. Uh, if you're going to be critical of what someone writes, um, I do believe they have to write it first. Mm. You can quote me on that. <laughs> That's true, Dr. Bregan. And I naively assumed that with the trial having concluded and a verdict reached, that what happened during the trial is now a matter of public record. Um, absolutely. The judge has said that um, I can talk about anything that has appeared in the trial itself and been made public through the trial including my testimony or the testimony of other people. Mm -hmm. Judge has been very clear about that, continues to be clear about it, and this is an attempt to get him to completely stifle me in regard to, literally, let me repeat it, any information he received in the course of this case. And Dr. Bregan, why do you think this approach is being taken? Well, there may be a number of issues involved. Um, I've seen many cases that have been influenced by drug company power and money, mostly in the early years, though, not recently so much as this. And I have no reason to believe the judge is, is doing anything but trying to, to, you know, make his judgments as reasonably as he can. Um, but I believe the, the uh, attack dogs here are the Commonwealth attorneys. Now, one of the things that's in the media is that the district attorney, that is the head of the office, is related to Conrad Roy. He is the third cousin of Conrad and the first cousin of Conrad's grandmother. And this was raised as an issue uh, early in the case uh, by her, uh, Michelle's attorneys and uh, was rejected. But the district attorney said he would not be personally involved. Now, since they've had like five or six assistant DAs involved, you don't think somebody's orchestrating this? It certainly seems that way, doesn't it? So that's one of the motivations that's going on. And the uh, Conrad Roy family, and I, and I, I know they've had a horrible tragedy, but it's also a, a very strong family in the, in the community, and very extended, as you can see from their connections, two cousin connections to the DA. Um, you know that 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 is p possibly I, I don't know their motivations. Hmm. Possibly one of their motivations. Uh, uh, whether other people have motivated them to protect the drug, which seems to be one of the great things going on in this country right now, is protect the psychiatric drugs. Hmm. They are, they are such remunerative products. They are indeed. Dr. Bregan, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm so grateful to be able to get the benefit of your wisdom and experience and to be able to share it with the listeners to the podcast. Hey, I've loved talking to you. You inspire me. This is one of the more open interviews I've done, so enjoy it. So, with many thanks to Dr. Bregan, that concludes part one of our interview, and be sure to look out for part two within the next week or so. Madden America News and Updates On Madden America, we wanted to let you know that on September the 12th, family therapist Marilyn Wedge and psychologist Gretchen Lefevre Watson will present an MIA continuing education webinar on non-drug interventions for youth diagnosed with ADHD. Nationally respected psychologist and family therapist Dr. Gretchen Lefevre Watson and Dr. Marilyn Wedge will show research that contradicts the mainstream conceptualization and treatment of ADHD in the United States and offer alternatives to psychiatric drugs for effectively resolving challenging behaviors at school and home. The webinar will be held on September 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and 5 p.m. British Summer Time. The webinar will last for approximately 90 minutes, and registration is $20. 
The course is designed to educate mental health professionals as well as the general public. To find out more and to register, visit maddenamerica.com and use the link at the top right-hand side of the homepage. So thank you for listening today. Please come back next week to hear the second part of our interview with the amazing Dr. Peter Bregin. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates. 